Right, hello, I'm Sarah Shaw, and I'm here to talk about Japan's mental health stigma and a look through film. Mental health is a complex issue in Japan, and there's overall stigma against it in society. This is true in Western culture, but because of some specific social issues and cultural context that Japan has, it's a very different situation than it is here. Um, there are three main points that I want to talk about here is some cultural context that I discussed just now, um, how the public views mental illness, and how the film portrays this mental illness and these cultural concepts. Um, now, first of all, the film uh, was A Record of Sweet Murder by Koji Shiraishi, which is the director of A Cult that we watched earlier in the semester came out about five years before this one. Um, I want to give a little bit of an overview about the film since it'll be hard to talk about it in depth without some context. So the format of the film, like a cult, is in a mockumentary format, but the setting and actual formatting of the film are quite distinct. Like, this film was taken all in one shot. Um, there was no clear transitions that happen it's just all one moment so it's very interesting from a film standpoint um the film largely takes place in one location due to this and the film does take place in south korea as opposed to japan though because it was produced in japan um it is through a japanese lens i believe this is still useful in an analysis of japanese culture um so, the characters of the film, first off. Um, it follows the story of two main characters, the journalist Kim Soyeon and serial killer Park Sanjiun. Park will quest for Soyeon, along with a Japanese cameraman, who is played by Shirei Shi himself, to meet with him for an interview. He hopes to provide an explanation for his murders, as well as have witnesses for the very end of his ritual. And he uses this to sort of justify his actions to both the rest of the world and to himself. So, the ritual. Sanjiun wants to resurrect his childhood friend, Yun Jin. She, he must kill 27 people when he's turned 27, and if he succeeds, Yun Jin and all of the people he has killed will be revived. Two other couples die, one off-screen and one later in the film, but as they aren't what the first couple is what the god Park is working for wants, they don't count towards his ritual. And at the end of the film, uh, or towards the ending, Sanjun realizes that the final two sacrifices are not the Japanese couple that he kidnapped, but himself and Soyeon. He completes his ritual, and you know, brings his god to their world, and is able to save Yun Jin. The god appears before... Sanjun sends, essentially sends him back in time to the point where uh, Yunjin would have died and he's allowed to stop those events from happening. And there's a few smaller details that happen, but these are overall the main points of the film. And now to get into some of the cultural concepts that are important to understanding this film, such as shame, get bad, and the hidden youth. So shame is a powerful concept in Japanese culture that ties into many of the other themes we've encountered. It has an incredible weight on how families and individuals deal with mental illness. Um, as oftentimes, people will go out of their way to avoid being a burden on others or inconveniencing them. Um, and in the movie directly, Senji admits a few times the shame he feels for his actions, but ultimately he decides to press on regardless, which will relate to a later point. Um, and it does play some important role in the context of mental health. Usually out of shame, the family tries to hide this domestic situation and refuses intervention from the outside until the point when it becomes uncontrollable. So families will often attempt to support their affected family member on their own, and hide them from the rest of society as if they're ashamed of them. They don't want to place this burden, their burden, on the rest of society.
and this does end up happening to Senjun in the film, where immediately following the accident that killed Yunjin, his family had Senjun hospitalized, and Soyeon herself said that it was incredibly hard to hear about what happened to him after that point. He effectively vanished. And this is, sadly, a fate that many people tended to face in Japan when faced with mental illness. Um, next is the theme of Genbat, which is something we've talked about before. The idea that everyone must try their best. Um, it's a concept that means well, but can carry extreme social pressure to perform as best as you can to keep up with society. Directly in the film, it carries... Um, it affects the characters and their actions and guides them to the point of no return. Um, despite his initial unwillingness to kill and the guilt that he feels of his crimes, uh, Sanjun does feel that he needs to do his best and see his task through to the end for himself, the people he killed, and for Yun Jin. Soyeon also follows this idea as she takes the job of interviewing Sanjun despite knowing the dangers. And finally, she accepts her role in his plans and allows him to kill her. Genbat is typically seen as something that's good, but it's guiding the characters in a more negative direction here. Um, for those with mental complications, part of the shame mentioned above stems from a lack of ability to do their best. Those who struggle with Genbat have a hard time fitting in with a society that is moving past them, which ties into this that I accidentally skipped to, um, the hikikomori, or social withdrawal, as it literally means. Uh, this point is more loosely touched upon in the film than the other two, but I believe that it is still a vital aspect of Japanese culture with relation to mental health, so I wanted to include it anyways. The hikikomori are social recluses, people who live alone at home and rarely step outside the comfort of their room. Typically, the internet becomes their main outlet. The reasons for someone becoming hikikomori are varied often, but they can be linked with various mental health complications that make it hard to navigate the rest of society. And this, again, ties back into the concept of shame. They might feel shame for not being able to cope or potentially being a burden, and so to alleviate this, they withdraw as much as they can. Um... Sanjun was not isolated by his own choice, but there are still parallels that can be drawn with what happened to him and the Hikikomori, since he was hidden away from the world so that he wouldn't be that burden on them. And from a purely filmmaking standpoint, this also lends itself well to the horror of a movie, specifically in a Japanese context. There is some history of Hikikomori, um, obviously not all of them, um, but there were some events where Hikikomori, say, left his room, boarded a bus, and held it hostage for 15 hours, and killed someone, and harmed a few others before he was caught. And these sorts of events, despite how few they were, had a big impact on how Japan perceived this group of people, and it was very negative, and only further drove a gap between them and the rest of society. This will go into the view of the public, and how the public of Japan views mental health as a reaction to the previous concepts. And it's important understanding these concepts better, but also understanding them through the lens of the film. And this will go into how even just simple language can Affect how people view things like this. And a little bit of disclaimer before I go ahead. I'm not a psychiatrist and I don't want to diagnose Senjun based on what little we got to see of him, but I will talk about something like that as I go on. Um, so in Japan, people with mental illnesses are considered deviant, weak, outside the norm. Their existence itself is a barrier preventing them from becoming full members of society. Um, so Sanjun and mental illness. Prior to the events of the film, it stated that Sanjun was committed to a mental hospital. And you never get to find out what he may have been diagnosed with, but the actions he displays in the film bear similarities to some symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, 
he's disorganized. He rapidly shifts moods from being somewhat pleasant and reasonable to sad or violent. He hears voices from his mysterious god, which could be hallucinations, and then experiences extreme delusions because of it. He'll often go to great re reaches to connect different events together to try to get them to match up with what his god was telling him. So schizophrenia in Japan has a rather interesting history. Um, it's important to note that while there are a lot of negative views of mental health in Japan, things are improving and the situation of schizophrenia is one of the things that is helping improve it, which is why I specifically wanted to talk about this. So before, um, in Japanese, schizophrenia was called Seishin Bonretsu Byo. Please don't get after me for the pronunciation of that, but it literally means split mind disease. And this name has very negative connotations, and as a result, it often took doctors an extended amount of time to provide patients with a diagnosis, if they did at all. Oftentimes their families were told, which only further contributed to the shame and wanting to hide people away. However, in 2002, 2002, after a lengthy examination process and support from many other families, they decided to rename the condition to Togo Shicho Cho, or Integration Disorder. Um, it was incredibly important, first of all, because it's a step forward for Japan for just not leaving those with mental illness in the dust, um, because it made the condition more palatable. And it made it seem like it was something that could be helped, rather than labeling the person as a burden for the rest of their life. And thanks to this, doctors had an easier time diagnosing their patients and providing them with adequate help. So even just the language that people used drastically affects how people see certain groups of people. And then finally, how it all ties into the Sanjin's character. He's... A very interesting choice for a main character in a movie, specifically because of his mental illness, and it's for a similar reason as in a cult with the Fritters and Neats. Is he's a stigmatized group for one thing, but another common trope in media is making a crazy person villain with a vague mental illness as a way to other them for the audience or use it just for some sort of scare factor, and. I don't believe this film falls into that pitfall, or it could, but not as bad as it could have. Because um, oftentimes in Western media, it's just used for this wow factor, just to make them seem other and scary. But Sanjun has a clear motivation. He's got history. You get to hear more about him as a person rather than just ooh, vague mental illness, crazy person. He's killing people for no reason. Um, and despite being considered an antagonist, he's not just defeated at the end of the film and thrown into jail or back into the mental hospital. His plan succeeds. So he's not just a crazy person who just gets discarded by the end of the movie. He's a well-rounded character and is part of the film who happens to have ties to mental illness. And despite my praise, there are still things I want to be a little critical of with relations to how his mental illness is treated as a character. For one, you never really get to find out what he has. And on one hand, it's not as important to the plot, but it does still lend itself to the vague illness crazy person trope. And in the end of the movie, he, secondly, in the end of the movie, he's effectively cured of his illness. He... His ritual succeeds, he goes back in time, stops Yunjun from being killed, or Yunjin, I'm mixing up their names, Yunjin, stops her from being killed, and so the events that would result in his illness never really happen. So while this isn't really realistic from a realistic standpoint, um, as you can't really cure mental illness, and it's dangerous to think that you can, this is also a horror film with time travel in oops in space worm gods so i take this point with a grain of salt and then finally because my battery's running low my computer <laughs> discussion 
some little points, you can feel free to use them as you want, but as happened in the Japanese term, as happened with the Japanese term for schizophrenia, do you think changing the language for a term can help fight against stigma? And are there any other concepts we touched upon previously that may tie into the characters, parts of the film, or to the topic of mental illness, like conformity? And if you haven't seen the film, if you want to look into it, you can, but just give me your best here. Again, bad. And then here's some cited sources and then image sources. So with these discussion points, thank you so much for listening to me for this presentation.